So thank you, everyone. This is um, my name is Domingo Silvas, CEO of Escape Artists, and I'm si excited to share this uh, webinar share this with you. Webinar with you. This is a Thursday night webinar, Thursday night webinar that we're having that here, we're and we have a special guest, Stephen Michael, on a, to me, which is a, an incredible, incredible topic, topic. Uh, that's gaining that's so much gaining ground so much that's in the news every single day, um, and it has to do with Bitcoin. And I think it's very, uh, Bitcoin's one of those things that is very libertarian, it's very free-minded. Um, it's in this, it's in the area that um, most people are just starting to accept. It's kind of like, um, not sure if it's, it's just unknown just and unknown. no one better no who knows better. there's no one better who knows no bitcoin knows as well bitcoin. as steven so steven welcome thank you thank you for having me on tonight Domingo. um no it's it's, um, no, it's so it's, tonight so is about tonight bitcoin it's about bitcoin. It's what are your thoughts you know um so, let's, let's go back and forth, back and, and, forth and, and let's see if we can reveal as much as we possibly can on bitcoin and what um, what are the secrets? What are the unknowns about Bitcoin? What are people? Why are people so scared? I, you know what? Answer that to start out with. Why are people so scared of Bitcoin? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I I would say it's just uh, the fear of something new, fear of the unknown. So, uh, like all new things, um, we have a lot of uh, trepidation. You know, you think about. Uh, the, the, the first time uh, uh, Henry Ford created the automobile, I bet there was a lot of fear in a lot of people uh, uh, to getting in this new, fast, sleek, uh, dangerous uh, new thing. And there was also a lot of uh, vested interests like the, um, uh, you know, the horse-drawn uh, buggy wagon makers, uh, vested interests who didn't want to see it succeed. So I think we see the same thing in Bitcoin today. Uh, you have old... Uh, old institutions who are reliant and, you know, on an old system that they're profiting from, and uh, they're going to fight it, obviously. And then, of course, just the fear of the unknown. So so it's not so bad once people start learning about it, though. So. Well, it's, it's one of the first, one of the first digital, digital currencies digital that's being accepted, being accepted on a global scale. Global scale. Uh, but it's not the first oh, one. Can you give me a little history on history digital currency and how it came around? How it came around? Sure, sure, and I'll and I'll just uh, address one one other thing on that last uh, comment before I jump into that. And uh, one of the things I found when I'm introducing people to Bitcoin, you know, I have two choices. I can go on a 30-minute explanation of what it is and economics and technology and mining and all that stuff, and uh, and and I'm not going to get anywhere other than a blank stare. Or what I can do is just ask them, do you have a smartphone? And if they do, I, I show them, you know, I say, hey, download uh, this app. Or if you're on iPhone, uh, uh, open up this web-based uh, app. And I said, let me send you uh, some little micro bitcoins and just to show you how it works. And so once I do that, um, uh, then now you have a discussion. And now they're owners. They're not just curiosity seekers, you know. And uh, but if they won't even be open to letting me send them some money, then I know not to spend a lot of time with, with people. But uh, but so now shifting gears to the history of digital currencies, um, yeah, we had uh, several things uh, back in the uh, you know right at the beginning of the internet. We had uh, uh, some ideas that came out. One was called uh, uh, I believe it was called Digicash. It was uh, 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 Tom was the inventor and creator of that. Uh, but he made a lot of uh, business mistakes and marketing mistakes, and it ultimately died. It, it was actually a true anonymous digital cash. Um, but he tried to partner up with some banks. He had some control issues, and and it kind of died and didn't go anywhere. And after that, uh, uh, several different things, ideas were floated. But probably the most successful before Bitcoin, uh, if we don't count PayPal, you know, but. But uh, one of the most successful ones before Bitcoin was a uh, a, a gold-backed digital currency, a company by the name of eGold, and they uh, uh, inspired several uh, uh, imitators. There's another one called eBullion, and so these were digital currencies that were just backed by gold and silver, and uh, those worked for a while and became very successful uh, until they uh, started coming under attack by regulators. And, uh, you know, the story behind eGold, you know, I, I can talk at length about that, but basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, Doug Jackson out of Florida uh, actually reached out to the regulators and said, hey, you know, we want to make sure we're compliant. We want to make sure there's not any problems. 
and uh, and we want your blessing as we go along. And so the whole time the uh, uh, the feds were were paying him lip service, and but they turned right around and stabbed him in the back and, and went and raided his office offices and shut down the database, which effectively collapsed the currency. And uh, and so that was a learning experience for people who wanted a free market money, a money that they could control and use without uh, third parties interfering with with their transactions. You know. If, if you and I want to trade, there should be nobody in between us who has a say in what we do, and uh, and so, so uh, uh, that exposed the flaw of a centralized database. So an eagle had the centralized database, and uh, it was just real easy to collapse the currency. You just raid the office that holds the database, and uh, and so Bitcoin actually solved that. And, uh, and so I can jump into that in a little bit too. But uh, but that was probably the most successful was eagle. Uh, eBullion came around. Uh, that has kind of a colored history. Uh, some of you who uh, who maybe followed that will remember uh, they they were actually very successful. They had a gold backed debit card, and uh, um, and everything was going well until that company started coming under attack uh, uh, by regulators as well. And uh, and the, the husband and wife that owned it out of uh, I believe it was California uh, started having problems. Were going through a divorce. And uh, the guy that owned the company ended up hiring a hitman to kill his wife, and so that collapsed that currency. But it was a kind of a colored, uh, uh, colored story there. So yeah, sure yeah it's a long checkered history <laughs> before Bitcoin. So. Um, I'm sure that didn't. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, it's an interesting, interesting story. So for to try back the technical um, um, issues that we're having. So Steve, I found out that. Um, what we're going to need to do is while I guess while I speak, uh, I might you might have to mute yourself, and then when you're speaking, I, I might have to mute myself so we don't. There's no background ground uh, background noise, but um, it's interesting. I'll tell you that what's interesting about Bitcoin that I I find fascinating is that it's a digital currency in a world that today uh, we have currency issues. I mean, we had an interview with you. Um, I had an interview with you not too long ago where we talked about currencies and you actually held up a billion dollar bill about how the collapse of a certain country's currencies came around. And that, that right there opened my eyes because we talk about the U S currency. Is it going to be the, you know, used as a standard in moving forward? You know, there's oil, there's different kind of different kind of currencies out there. And what's it, you know, so everybody was looking to Bitcoin. Everybody saw that it, had, it was a shining light. It was the possibility, but then, oh my gosh, something goes wrong. It goes from $1,200 in value down to 400 or, uh, and next thing you know, there's millions of Bitcoin missing. So that it almost seems that it, it's, you know, there's almost no currency in today's world that, um, is flawless, right? So it, it, it kind of made Bitcoin a little bit more real. Uh, but it also made a lot more, made it riskier. And the question is, you know, is the truth is, is there more risk in Bitcoin as there is in American dollar? It's probably the same risk as you go to any other currencies. But it's an interesting topic because most people who are afraid of, afraid of like the Bitcoin as a digital currency, um, they almost don't see it as uh, as the dollar bill as being the same risk, which in, in, in many in many cases, it almost is in today's economy. Um, so, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, to me, it just boggles my mind. Okay, yeah. So you, you brought up some good points because, yeah, it is uh, early days of Bitcoin. It's kind of like um, uh, when the iPhone first came out. Uh, when the iPhone came out, the service was horrible. Uh, people couldn't get uh, good connections. Uh, you know, you. Those famous commercials of "Can you hear me now?" Right? Uh, those, um, th those, you know, with any new technology, there's there's certain pieces of that technology that are that are not complete yet. And in the Bitcoin world, Bitcoin itself is 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 solid, but it's the user interfaces that are being built out there by all these entrepreneurs are making that part easy because it is kind of geeky right now, and it is. Uh, it is a little tricky to learn how to get up, get it, get it, get it going and running. And um, so, so Bitcoin has different risks than the dollar does. And and so the differences are in Bitcoin, the risks are operator error. 
and uh, unfortunately, we as humans aren't very good at data security or computer security, and so so that's what's led to many high-profile thefts of people's bitcoins um, because they didn't properly protect their keys, it, you know, their private keys, which is basically physical possession of their bitcoins, and um, and so that's something that's solvable. Uh, it'll just take a little bit of time, and those of us who get involved now and and uh, we can profit two ways. One way is we can profit by building tools that make it easier. And, uh, and so that when it does become grandma friendly, uh, it will be worth a whole lot more than it is now because the masses will come in. And so we get rewarded as early adopters by acquiring them now. Uh, so that's one way to profit. Another way to profit is to, um, is to well, just, just simply, uh, um, you know, building businesses and then accumulating them. You know, accumulate those bitcoins. But, but uh, with with the dollar, the problems with the dollar are that uh, uh, those are systemic problems. So at the core, Bitcoin is solid. It's just the edges that, that people are, are are learning how to adapt to it. But it, the dollar is rotten to the core. The dollar is uh, uh, backed by. Uh, uh, well, you know, the U.S. dollar, the U.S. government, backed by the U.S. government, which is in debt to the tune of $17.5 trillion. And so that is debt that mathematically will never be paid off uh, unless they print more dollars to, to, uh, to pay off that debt. And what that will do is that will cause us to be in a situation like, like you mentioned. I, I went ahead and pulled it up here. This is the uh, Zimbabwe $100 billion note. I always like to carry this. But if you look close at the date there, it's July of 2008. So they just destroyed their currency recently. And, uh, and, and so to deal with that $17 trillion debt, the U.S. has to do one of two things. Uh, ac actually, three things. They have three options. One is uh, cut all costs and, uh, and, and run a positive cash flow in their business uh, as far as managing the money. And we know that's not going to happen because they'd have to actually... Uh, uh, cut off all social security. They'd have to, uh, uh, um, uh, in order to pay that debt, they'd actually, they could actually move to 100% income tax and still not have enough to uh, pay off the debt uh, because it's so large. Um, so their only other option is to pay it off with cheaper dollars. So run the printing presses, do the quantitative easing. And uh, uh, Bernanke, for the last couple of years, uh, was printing, I believe, $80 billion a month of new money going into the system. They, they would generate it and use it to buy these uh, treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities. And uh, that's $80 billion of new money coming to the, into the economy that devalues the rest of our money here. And, and you know, in Bitcoin, there will only ever be 21 million uh, Bitcoins in existence. And, uh, and so we have a limited supply that's regulated by math, much like gold and silver supplies are regulated by nature. And uh, I would argue Bitcoin is more scarce than gold or silver because uh, there's a finite limit in, 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 that, uh, in that 21 million, whereas gold and silver, uh, there's plenty of it out there. It's just not real cost effective to mine it. But if the price goes up high enough, it might be cost efficient to go in and and uh, mine gold from the oceans or uh, uh, send uh, expeditions to asteroids and mine it from asteroids, you know. So, so there's supplies out there that at some point could be profitable to go out and mine. But whereas in Bitcoin, there will never, ever be more than 21 million Bitcoins. And so that gives you a system that, uh, that can help preserve value as a store of value. Now, you bring up a good point, okay, because... As new to Bitcoin as I am and, and a lot of people out there, you know, you hear about mining Bitcoin. So you think you, you just said right now there's only 21 million, but yet there's, you know, a few thousand people out there mining Bitcoin. And, and you know, this could be a, a, a barrier or an issue with the language because there's date, you know, there's people mining for Bitcoin. And you, you think, well, that means there's people creating more and more Bitcoin. It's just going to be the same issue that we're having with any other world currency. So um, so. Tell us what does mining actually do that um, toward when it comes to Bitcoin? Sure. So without getting too technical, um, uh, uh, mining is probably a poor term, but it's a good analogy. And, and the analogy was purposely 
uh, used to compare to gold, uh, the, the, the act of getting gold out of the ground. And so in the, in the Bitcoin code, uh, there's a cap of 21 million Bitcoins that will ever be issued. And the way they introduced them into the money supply is uh, what they would do is they re reward people for contributing computing power to uh, do two things, to help secure the network, to, um, uh, to process transactions, to validate transactions, uh, and, uh, and to uh, maintain that, you know, that public ledger called the blockchain. And, and so in exchange for people contributing computing power to do that, the system at a predetermined rate on average every 10 minutes would spit out a few bitcoins randomly awarded to any of these people who are, who are helping to, to provide all these functions. And it's basically the security and the verification of, of payments. And so, so every 10 minutes for the first years, 50 bitcoins came uh, into circulation. And uh, in, in the way Satoshi Nakamoto created this was to kind of mimic uh, gold mining in a sense that when they first discovered gold, it was, it was plentiful and easy. You could pick it up off the ground. Uh, it was in the riverbeds. You could just reach down and grab it. And, uh, and once all that was collected, then you had to start panning for gold. You had to dig for it a little bit. And then once all that gold was taken, uh, it took more effort and less return, and you had to uh, mine for it. And now you have very sophisticated mines and equipment because uh, it's very difficult now. The easy stuff is done. So in Bitcoin, what Satoshi Nakamoto did is he said, okay, we're going to set this up to where we're going to have a cap of 21 million Bitcoins. But for the first four years, we'll only release 50 Bitcoins into circulation every 10 minutes. And then every four years, that reward is what they call it, that reward for securing the network and processing transactions, that reward will cut in half. So after the fourth year, which was, I think, a year, a year or two ago, um, it dropped to 25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. And then after that second four-year period goes by, it'll drop to 12 and a half Bitcoins every 10 minutes. And it'll keep doing that, having, having, and having. So when you look at a, uh, uh, you know, a graph, uh, you'll see in the beginning, it's, you know, the rate of, of uh, supply is really high, and then it kind of levels off. And in about 100 years, it'll, you know, it'll, it'll cap out at 21 million. So one question a lot of people have is, is, well, gosh, 21 million units, that's not enough to power the global economy. But each Bitcoin is divisible to eight decimal points. So that gives you over, I think, 2.1 quadrillion units, which is more than enough to power the global economy. And if it ever wasn't enough, uh, they could simply move that decimal point over and uh, we can do more. So uh, Bitcoin is really amazing because of that hard limit we're seeing uh, the price really rise. So a lot of people say the dollar is uh, volatile, uh, but uh, I'm sorry, Bitcoin is volatile, but you can also look at it as the dollar being volatile because one year ago today, uh, Bitcoin bought $100, well, Bitcoin bought $100, but today Bitcoin buys $440. And so over the long-term trend, uh, Bitcoin is doing way better than the dollar. And, uh, and those who have held Bitcoins over the last 12 months have done better than the, those who have held dollars. But in between that 12 months, we've seen spikes, corrections, spikes, and corrections going all the way up. And uh, so it's like any long-term uh, bull market. It's never a straight line. You're going to have uh, rallies and corrections, you know, manias and despair as people get overheated and overexcited and then they and then they bail out and you see a correction. But uh, it's kind of like two steps forward and one step back. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of a, you know, how Bitcoin derives its value is that it's useful and uh, it's, it's uh, efficient and it's in limited supply. And so it, it makes it a really good money. And it's not the panacea to solve all problems, but it sure does solve a lot. You know, that's, that's fascinating, especially if you're new to this. And if you're joining us, um, thank you for coming in and let us know where you're dialing in from. And then to go ahead and ask some questions, because this is a perfect time to get Steve's attention about Bitcoin. So if there's questions that you may have about Bitcoin, please put it in the bo question box. And I'll make sure I get them out so that we can get them answered during this time period. Because I know I'm going to get mine, because uh, this is the time to definitely go out and get some more information about Bitcoin. You know, first of all, I, I can understand 
I can understand that whole logic behind, and obviously it's created by someone much, much smarter than I am. Uh, but what's fascinating was what Bitcoin actually stands for in digital currency. It was not the first, but it's definitely one to make the mainstream and allow other companies like Overstock and, and hotels and, and airlines. And you can um, you can actually go and you know travel your entire vacation by just using Bitcoin. So I think that one is very fascinating. You know, there's gas stations accepting them now. I believe over by where you're at is one of the first gas stations in, in your neck of the woods. We've got, um, like I said, travel companies. We've got product companies. Um, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger, bigger voice, you know, and everyone really likes that secrecy and to the point where the IRS had to step down and, you know, or step up, however you want to call it, and and start saying that it, Bitcoin is something that's taxable now. Uh, wait a minute. We want our money. We want our part. Um, so we're going to tax Bitcoin in one fashion or another. And so they started slowly, but I think it's going to become, as it becomes more and more of a, a world power in a currency state, it's definitely going to become, um, uh, it's going to become more and more interesting. I'll tell you that much, especially when there's other countries out there doing the same. And, and so when it comes to, you know, Bitcoin being out there and being a currency for, for people, um, you know, what do you think? Uh, what do you think the possibility is the biggest news that's going to happen in 2014 that's going to really just flood things open in 2015 when it comes to digital currency that's out there? Sure, I think I think the uh, big thing we've got coming around the corner that in 2014 is is uh, I believe we'll see major exchanges open for business uh, on U.S. soil. Uh, New York was. Uh, um, uh, the first state to kind of really pay attention to this area, and they came out of the gate somewhat negative, and uh, and and uh, uh, you know with the idea that we're going to regulate this wild west industry, and um, and as time has gone on and as they've done their homework, uh, they've realized that this is an innovation that can actually bring talent and capital to the United States and in tax revenue too. Um, and so they've actually started uh, softening their stance, and now they're looking for a way to figure out how they can um, sanction uh, exchanges to operate in the state of New York and maybe attract and, and, and lay down some clear guidelines so entrepreneurs will know what they have to deal with. And so I believe that will happen uh, before the end of the year. We'll see some major exchanges open uh, in New York, uh, maybe elsewhere, but I think that will be the first place. And what that will do is that will open the floodgates for uh, institutional money to come in because the total current market cap of Bitcoin right now is somewhere in the neighborhood of $6 billion, which is a, a drop in the bucket. There's hedge funds out there that have more than $6 billion. And so, so a lot of pieces are kind of falling into place now for that to happen. One of those is that uh, um, uh, uh, Different companies are, are throwing a ton of venture capital in to, to uh, uh, put a framework in place so this can happen. And so, like the Winklevoss twins, who were, uh, um, uh, depending on whose side you believe, helped create Facebook, and they achieved, you know, they uh, received a big uh, award from, uh, uh, you know, Zuckerberg in, in the settlement. They, I think they earned like $200 million in that lawsuit. Uh, they turned around and bought a ton of bitcoins and uh, and uh, bought them around I don't know ten eleven dollars a bitcoin now they're four hundred dollars a bitcoin so they're they're doing really well they they take a lot of heat but they were very brave in this space and uh, they're now uh, going to have their own uh, bitcoin fund listed on the Nasdaq and so that's going to provide a way for institutional money to come in. Uh, we've got uh, Barry Silbert from uh, SecondMarket.com. This is a company that helped uh, finance uh, companies like Twitter and Facebook in the early days when they were going through their early growth stages before they went public. Uh, his company helped uh, institutional and or accredited investors invest in those companies. And he just recently, uh, well, last year, started the Bitcoin Investment Trust. Uh, which now has, I, I think, I don't know, 50, 60 million dollars in bitcoins that institutional investors can invest in. And uh, incidentally, he is uh, his company is the one, one of the probably one of the first ones who will have an exchange in New York. And so, so th I think that's going to be the biggest thing happening this year. 
we also have a lot of tools that are coming out that'll that'll help protect us from ourselves. You know, uh, make it harder for us to lose our coins or be hacked. Uh, um, you know, the the whole Mount Gox uh, story was uh, uh, where people left their money on deposit with this exchange, and uh, in and then the exchange uh, went broke or got robbed or they stole the funds. Nobody's quite sure what happened. It's probably a combination of all three. And uh, in 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 it it really kind of uh, I think taught a lot of people the lesson that you know you never really own something unless you have physical possession of it. So uh, just like gold bars or uh, cash in hand is always better than money in the bank. And same with bitcoins. If you have them on deposit with some third party institution, uh, you don't own them. They own them, and then they owe you a promissory note. And so if they default on that, then you're exposed to that counterparty risk and, and you could lose out. So taking physical possession is a big deal. So there's tools now called uh, uh, multi-signature transactions and uh, uh, that so, so that they can't take your uh, uh, bitcoins without your permission. So, so all of these things that are going to make it easier for grandma uh, are, are going to come into play about the same time that uh, the big exchanges open up. And, uh, you know, we could see another 10, 100 times growth in the price of Bitcoin uh, within the next 12 months. So, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we're at, you know, anywhere from two to $5,000 of Bitcoin, you know, just by the end of this year. So that's kind of what I'm seeing right now. You know, that's fascinating because um, I have a question here where from um, somebody here who actually wants to get a better understanding on how to get started with Bitcoin, and then where on the web, um, you're with the Digital Currency Institute, so um, and that's Digital Currency Institute dot org, correct? Oh, I mean, no mute. That's correct, right? Yes. So, um, so the Digital Currency Institute dot org, we have free resources there, and I have a couple of favorite uh, tools that I like to help. A brand new person with, and um, number one, if you're you're on if you're on iPhone, you're at a serious disadvantage just because uh, iPhone is a walled garden, and they've been kind of uh, uh, hostile to Bitcoin lately. So uh, I think it's going to a war that they're going to lose, and they're going to have to capitulate at some point because the market the market will win in the end, and the market wants Bitcoin, and so. So I just, I'm a big fan of iPhone. I've used them for years, but I just finally got rid of mine because I wanted more choices with my money, and the Android phones uh, let me do that. So, um, so in other words, in, in the iPhone world, uh, you're real restricted on what apps you can have in that store that are Bitcoin related, and it's because uh, uh, um, Apple wants to create their own uh, payment system through their phones. So, you know, that's their, their system. That's their right to to uh, do what they want with it, but uh, uh, what's going to happen is they're pushing business out to Android because Android gives, you know, we the consumers more choices at this point. So one of my favorite wallets, uh, I've got about, uh, you know, I think two really awesome wallets. Uh, one is blockchain.info, so that's the website as well. You go to blockchain.info and you can set up a, a great wallet that has great security features It'll allow you to spend right from your smartphone. Uh, you can also access their system through the web interface on, on iPhone. You go through your Safari browser and you'll be able to access it, but it's a little more clunky. Uh, they are in development with a better version for uh, iPhone, so that'll come out soon. So, so you iPhone folks don't have to worry too much. It'll, it'll come around for you. <laughs> but if you can't wait, get, a, get an Android. So uh, the second wallet that I really like is called... Uh, um, it's called Mycelium, which is uh, spelled M-Y-C-E-L-I-U-M. And you just go download it from the uh, the Play Store and Google. And uh, what's really cool about that app is that it also has a built-in uh, uh, directory of people who are looking to buy and sell Bitcoins in your area. So you can open up your app and click Buy or Sell, and you can either place an ad to sell or find people who are selling. And it'll let you communicate with those people, and it encrypts your chat. And you work out a deal. You meet at the local Starbucks. You can buy or sell however much Bitcoin you want to sell. And so what that does is that reduces the dependence on these middlemen banking institutions. 
And so it truly does give you a way to, you know, have your own personal banker. I tell people I have about 10 or 15 personal bankers because I just open up my app and I find people there who will meet me outside of bankers hours over coffee who we'll actually enjoy each other's company and will buy and sell Bitcoin with each other. And so, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what time of day I can find someone who's willing to either buy or sell me Bitcoin. And so those are two apps that I like for someone brand new getting started. Uh, on, our, on the digitalcurrencyinstitute.org, we have a whole uh, uh, a list of things you can do to enhance your security. So those are wallets that are good for small uh, uh, walking around money. And then when you want to store large amounts of Bitcoin, uh, we have a tutorial in there that shows you how to actually uh, put your coins in cold storage, which means they don't ever touch the Internet, they don't ever touch your phone, and it's a way you can put your long-term storage there, and that's money that, that you know, maybe is your mother load or your, or your, you know, your retirement funds, and, uh, and, and you can secure them and not worry about having them uh, hacked or stolen from you. So that's, the, that's a quick way to get started. <laughs> Yeah. Now, so it's interesting, um, you know, we probably went to the far end as far as, you know, how complicated and the theory behind what, how Bitcoin is uh, and what other people see in the mining behind it. But the truth is, it's really simple. When we talk about selling Bitcoin or buying Bitcoin, uh, people don't really realize it. It's very digital. Um, it's a matter of scanning something from your phone, a scanning a QR code from your phone and in between two apps selling uh, a digital currency and actually receiving real cash. I mean, so you may spend four hundred and forty-four dollars to buy a Bitcoin and have only one Bitcoin in your wallet, but in the future, when it goes up to eight hundred dollars, somebody will actually take that one Bitcoin and pay you back eight hundred dollars. So it's interesting. It's it's one of those um, it's one of those things where it's a bet. Uh, it could be as much as a an investment or a stock market kind of trade that you do. You buy a stock at a dollar and hope it goes up to two. Um, but the difference is this: you can actually use this to purchase things. You can get business. You can get um, uh, what do you call them? Gift cards. You can go buy things with it immediately or store it in your wallet. So, real quick, what I like to do is is, is kind of demonstrate how simple um, you have your phone nearby. I imagine how simple it is, really, what a QR code looks like, and obviously, um, and and so everybody can kind of see what it looks like, and then. Um, and you know, and how it works from there, or however you can demonstrate this process so that people can understand that it's really the simple of, it's almost like two phones touching and, and somebody's making money and the, uh, the other one's buying it, the, the product or selling a product and buying a product. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, and what I will do is I won't show my, uh, uh, my wallet on my phone just because, uh, for privacy reasons, I don't want my, uh, address up on the web, but what will happen in your phone is it will render a uh, Bitcoin address that looks a little bit like this. And uh, what it consists of is a string of digits across the bottom, which you could look at as your account number or an invoice number, however you want to look at it. And then that's represented in this QR code up here, which can be scanned. And so um, your wallets, uh, basically, they'll just generate this in your phone. And the person next to you who wants to pay you can scan that and send funds to you. And, uh, you know, if anybody wants to send a lot of money to this uh, uh, public address, I'll gladly take it. So, But uh, there's also a private key here, which I won't show, but it looks very similar to it. But I've got it hidden behind, uh, behind this piece of paper here. So um, that private key is like the password to your account. And the, the, any wallet you use out there, whether it's something for your phone or your computer, uh, they're basically designed to manage those private keys that are hidden back there. And that's what gives you the power to uh, uh, control the, the money that's in there, to send it to other people. And so the private keys are what you want to protect. It's like uh, physical cash. So if you lose those or if someone copies those, uh, you could lose all the money that you have in that particular wallet. So, um, um, so the tools are, are are in place now and are being built to make those much easier to protect. Um, but yeah, that's it. You just uh, you know, I was at uh, helping a friend of mine who owns a bakery today. We helped him set up uh, Bitcoin in the store, and I just had him uh, you know download a quick app on the phone. Um, uh, and then uh, he was in business, so he now has himself opened up to this six billion dollar market, and he can now uh, get a new class of of, of uh, customers. And so, so this is a great thing for business people to do to 
to uh, uh, open themselves up to to more business. And let's say you don't even like Bitcoin at all, or you think it's too risky. There's services like uh, BitPay.com and Coinbase.com, which uh, have merchant solutions that will allow them to, you know, the merchant that will allow them to accept payment in Bitcoin, and they will instantly convert it to cash and then credit your bank account the next day so that you don't ever have any currency exchange rate risk. Um, because, you know, as the price of the dollar fluctuates or the price of Bitcoin fluctuates, however way you want to look at it, um, uh, you know, there might be a little bit of exchange rate risk. But over time, I've found that, uh, um, you know, uh, as I'm acquiring Bitcoins over time, uh, you know, some, sometimes they lose a little value, sometimes they gain a little value, but overall, uh, the value of mine over time are up, I don't know, thousands of percent. So um, I don't worry about day-to-day -day fluctuations because I'm a long-term accumulator. And, uh, and, and um, you know, it, I, if it, it, someone did a, a, an analysis on Reddit a while back, and they said, uh, uh, if you've owned Bitcoins longer than a year, you're you're farther ahead than, than you were when you bought them. And so it's when you start holding them less than a year that you get, you're more susceptible to those fluctuations. So when I first bought Bitcoin, I heard about it when they were about $7. And by the time I figured out how to buy it um, or found someone who could sell them to me, it's not as easy as it is today. Um, but by the time I found someone to sell it to me, the price had shot up to $30 and I bought a bunch at $30. And then a few days later, the, that mania cooled off, and it corrected back down to five or six or seven dollars. So uh, the average person will look at that and think, "Oh man, you just lost a lot of money." But I had the long-term view. I could, I, you know, based on the economics of it, I saw this as something that could potentially change the world. And if it did, it would be worth in the hundreds, if not millions, of dollars per Bitcoin. So that correction didn't bother me. I wasn't buying it to hold on to it for a week or two and then sell it. I, I had a longer term plan. So it took about a year for that price to cross 30 again. And, uh, and then it started moving and, uh, um, and then it went up to, uh, I think the next really big rally was uh, $260. And I ended up buying a bunch of 260 the very day it peaked. And then the very next day it corrected down to sixty dollars. So again I bought at the top, but I didn't sell. And uh, and so uh, that was last a year ago. Uh, then back in November they spiked again all the way up to eleven hundred and thirty dollars. I was still buying at eleven hundred and thirty, but soon after that we had a correction down to about four hundred dollars, you know, give or take a little bit. And uh, and so now we're sitting at the bottom of this correction, uh, I think it's the bottom. Uh, of around four hundred and forty dollars, and I'm still buying. And, and and quite frankly, every morning I get up, I look at the price, and if it's anything less than a hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars, uh, I'm buying because I think that's the minimum it'll be worth within the next you know maybe five years. So I don't care about the day-to-day -day fluctuations. I'm a long-term accumulator, and I can go into more details if you like me to in a minute on how I come up with that hundred and forty thousand dollar figure. <laughs> Um, I think it's curious, uh, it, you know, it's fascinating. Um, you know, so there is, you are the host of an upcoming Bitcoin online summit where a lot of this information is going to be shared, but you being the host, you're getting a chance to really interview a lot of the pioneers of Bitcoin, uh, probably people who've been around Bitcoin or other kind of, uh, digital currencies before you, um, and who have more of, um, of, um, I guess you could say, like a, they're, they're pioneers. You know, they know it. They're they're either creating a product in it, or they're working it, or they're out speaking about it. And and so I think it's I think it's exciting. And I know that um, here at Escape Bars, we're participating with the with the Bitcoin Online Summit because it's just it's one of those things I think is truly fascinating, and it's one of those leading topics that are going to be in, that's in the news every day. So people want to know more about it. Can you share on one the Bitcoin Online Summit? Um, you know, who are you going to be talking to and what kind of people are going to be attend, um, kind of the speakers there. And, and I believe this is the first, uh, ever Bitcoin online summit on the, on the internet. And so it's exciting, um, uh, for, first of all, for us to be involved, but you know, what about this, the speakers you're about to speak with, 
uh, or interview during the process. Sure. Yeah. So I'll tell you a little bit about them, and I've got the uh, pages loading right now, so it might uh, kick up some uh, autoplay. So I'll, I'll mute that out in just a second. But um, uh, you know, I'll just go through the uh, speakers here. Hold on a second. Okay. So um, I think we've got probably the best lineup. Uh, you know, of any conference this year, and, and we're adding new speakers daily. So um, you know, some of the people we have speaking are, are, are just, uh, um, you know, incredible thought leaders in economics, in law, in uh, entrepreneurship, and uh, just brilliant in 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 the cryptography, coding, uh, and, and so it's it seems like this is the segment of the marketplace that is attracting the most excitement uh, uh, and talented people out there. If you're an engineer or a uh, um, uh, you know, someone who's involved in finance or economics or cryptography, it's really hard not to get addicted to what the potential is uh, with all these technologies. So some of the people we have are uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Trace Mayer, who is an early angel investor in uh, BitPay and Kraken and, and Bitcoin Armory, which is a, a great ultra-secure uh, wallet for your Bitcoins. And, uh, you know, he began publicly recommending Bitcoin at 25 cents a Bitcoin. And, uh, unfortunately, I didn't know him very well back then. Otherwise, I would have uh, bought a bunch. And uh, so, so he is a very strong proponent of property rights, individual freedom. He's got uh, degrees in accounting and law. Um, we also have uh, Roger Veer, which is, who is a, uh, you know, I really uh, uh, am impressed with what he's been able to do and uh, in, in the vision he saw of Bitcoin as a liberating tool for for the individual uh, as a voluntarist uh, libertarian um, he you know he, he made the statement which I think is true is that this is probably the most significant invention since the internet and uh, potentially even greater than the internet and so because of, uh, of his uh, commitment to dedication and, and his ability to finance many of these early startups, um, uh, this whole industry has grown tremendously in, in, in large part to what he's done. Uh, he was an early investor in blockchain.info. Uh, uh, he created a website called bitcoinstore.com. So if you go to that site, you can buy just about uh, any uh, high-tech electronics uh, uh, stuff on there, and, and you're going to probably get it cheaper than Amazon.com or anyone else, and they only take Bitcoin. Um, he uh, he made the prediction uh, a year or two ago that uh, Bitcoin will outperform uh, gold and silver by, I don't know if it was 10 times or 100 times, uh, and it was within, a I think, a one-year period or something. I forget the time frame, but he only missed it by a few uh, weeks, I, I believe it was, and... Uh, um, and and he was spot on. Uh, uh, you know, he's he's a person uh, uh, of integrity, I believe, and uh, and we're excited to have him as a speaker. And, and then next we have the CEO of Blockchain.info, which is uh, Nick Carey. Uh, he's just uh, uh, you know a great uh, public spokesperson for a great company. Uh, talks a lot about how they operate 100% on Bitcoin. They don't pay their salaries in in dollars or or anything like that. It's all Bitcoin. So they live on Bitcoin. They travel on Bitcoin. They do everything they can with Bitcoin. Uh, and then we've got some some really amazing and talented people like uh, Amir Taki, who is uh, is a, a leading proponent of of creating social change and using money to do it, using cryptography to do that, using finance to do that, to empower the individual and and reduce the violence. Uh, of many of these institutions that are out there, so he's, you know, he's been instrumental in creating the uh, the dark wallet, which is a Bitcoin privacy tool, uh, and uh, dark market, which is a uh, open source uh, uh, proof of concept that allows people to uh, create and engage and trade with other people in a much more safe and secure way. Uh, then we've got Vitalik Buterin, who is. Uh, 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 brilliant in his own right, who's leading up the project called Ethereum, which is a whole other class of, of uh, crypto technology that can 
uh, uh, you know, show us new things that we can do with uh, blockchain technologies. And so it'll be exciting to hear from him. Uh, we've got Chris Odom, who's developing and working on products or projects called Open Transactions uh, and uh, Monitas, which is their commercial arm. Thing with your with your bitcoins and, and, and any other asset for that matter, so that you know, open transactions is a a, a tool set that uh, I think don't gets enough credit right now. Uh, but we are, I think we're going to hear a lot of good things from them in the future, and we're going to see uh, open transactions solving a lot of the uh, uh, problems that uh, that we have in this space. And it works extremely well with bitcoin. It doesn't compete with bitcoin. Uh, it uh, enables it and makes it stronger. And so we have him. We have, of course, uh, the famous Stephanie Murphy from Let's Talk Bitcoin uh, is going to be uh, uh, spreading some more of her knowledge with us. Uh, you know, I can go on and on about it with these people. I mean, Paul Rosenberg, author of uh, Free Man's Perspective, also wrote the book uh, A Lodging of Wayfaring Men. If you haven't read that book, it's available for free download on the Internet. In that book, uh, published, I think, maybe 10 years ago, he... Uh, he basically uh, created a fictional story of these of these dark markets and these I like to call them free markets markets where people are free to trade with each other without third party interference and uh, and it was all about crypto and in uh, the tools and so if you're uh, interested in, a, in a, an exciting thriller if you like uh, Bitcoin or any digital currency you've got to download that book and read it it's a, it's called a lodging of wayfaring men. Um, he publishes uh, uh, Free Man's Perspective, which is a great uh, newsletter. Uh, CryptoHippie.com is a uh, 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 anonymous web surfing uh, uh, service. Uh, so uh, definitely a, a, a great thought leader in, in this space. Uh, you know, we had Jeff Garzik, gosh, you know, one of the core developers of uh, Bitcoin, uh, now employed by BitPay to help uh, uh, make the system stronger. Uh, he's also been the proponent of the Bitcoins in Space idea, where they'll <laughs> launch a, a, a satellite up that helps broadcast the blockchain public ledger and help keep that, uh, you know, maybe enable people to continue transacting Bitcoins in places where they uh, weren't able to before in certain parts of the Earth. And so, I, I mean, it can go on and on. We've just got a lot of great people. So um, uh, I highly recommend people attend this event because uh, that they will... Uh, get uh, you know a hundred times their money's worth. Um, you know one other person I'll just talk a little bit about is uh, Ryan uh, X Charles, also known as Astro Hacker, and uh, he wrote a, a, an article that was uh, uh, instrumental to me early on in Bitcoin. He I think he discovered it about three weeks before I did, and he wrote an article called uh, uh, Bitcoin is the Economic Singularity, and you can uh, Google it and find that. I recommend everybody read that. And uh, he took a lot of heat for the things he said in that article, and it turns out that uh, he wasn't too far off about the potential of Bitcoin, and uh, and he's doing really well with it now. So also working with Bitcoin, BitPay, developing some really great tools for us. So um, so anyway, there's lots of good things happening with this uh, event, and uh, and uh, you know, folks are going to have a chance to to hear some free uh, pre interviews with some of them. And, uh, and we'll get to talk about that. So anyway, I've talked long enough. I'll pause there. So. <laughs> well, it sounds like it does sound exciting because I tell you that um, I had a chance to listen to those some some of those uh, pre interviews for the Bitcoin Online Summit, and um, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, to think. You know, you, you think that there's a lot of techies involved in this whole thing, but when we had a conversation with Pamela Morgan and she's an attorney and she sees the, the a different view from Bitcoin and to hear that uh, interview was absolutely fascinating to just uh, get a different point of view from a legal standpoint on different aspects of Bitcoin because what people don't seem to get and I'm, I really hope that they really do coming through the, the Bitcoin Online Summit is that they get a chance to understand and get from a beginner's view all the way to an advanced view, expert view of Bitcoin, and everyone's at a different point. You know, some people just want the beginners, and we'll we'll ha you know it'll have that component, and some people want to hear from the experts. But 
but it, it's all available in a digital uh, format. So a platform. So that means you'll be able to listen to it down, you know, not, you know, download it, view it and, and really get in over and over and over again. Cause I, I know like sometimes you have to read a book three times before you say, ah, I get it or watch a movie a couple times. And then in the uh, Bitcoin online summit allows that. Now I know I do want to bring this up. You are um, one of our special speakers at the Global Online Summit. And I know that um, during your session, you're going to be talking about Bitcoin and the beginning of Bitcoin and the, um, the start of it. And, and people can actually view your interview because we had a, had a great interview of you uh, on the Global Online Summit um, for about 10 I, I got a good 20 minutes. Uh, Macarena Rose was able to interview you on uh, you know, the beginning part. And that's where I heard about the. Uh, the hundred billion dollar currency and um, and then your views on how you actually brought up two things which I think was fascinating on how um, Bitcoin saves lives and I think that point of the interview to me was very very intriguing uh, because you, from your point you really do thinking about it saying you know how can a Bitcoin save life it's a digital <laughs> currency what can it possibly do to you know perform uh, but it's your points are very very fascinating um, do you have anything um, on that? Hang on a second. Here you go. Sure. Yeah. That's uh, you know, you know, that's what my motivation for Bitcoin was. Is it was a way to uh, empower the individual. And uh, you know, if you can control the money, you can control the people. And we know that uh, uh, you know the control of our monetary system and just about every monetary system on the planet is 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 uh, right is controlled by a very small group of people. And so they can finance wars at will. They can uh, uh, issue debt, uh, uh, you know, to finance these these wars. And in a world of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin is going to force these nation states to better manage their currencies. And uh, in order to compete against Bitcoin, they've got to rein in their spending. Uh, um, it, you know, it would be a little harder for them to finance these. Uh, uh, you know, boondoggle projects or or incredible wars. Uh, if they had to come ask us every time they wanted to finance those things, and so Bitcoin gives the average person a way to opt out of that system and stop supporting that system. So every dollar you hold in your pocket, uh, you know, depending on your viewpoint, but one viewpoint is is that every dollar you hold in your pocket, you're supporting a system that is a gross violator of individual property rights. And uh, war being the biggest one, you know, uh, you know, taking away uh, not only property and liberty, but but the very lives of people, uh, you know, financed through these debt systems. And uh, I was listening to a webinar the other day that, uh, um, you know, just the uh, quote unquote war on terror, which is uh, makes absolutely no sense. You know, you can't have war on an abstract. Um, and uh, all they have to do is label someone a terrorist, and they can keep this war on terror going on forever. And, uh, and and so, but the the money spent on that, uh, I, I heard somewhere that that's an average of over seventy five thousand dollars per household uh, in the U.S. And uh, so, if someone would have came to ask you permission to take your seventy five thousand dollars, right now they saddle you with either taxes or inflation to pay for that. Uh, um, but if someone were forced to ask you to pay $75,000 for this war that you may not have any interest in, um, I think a lot of people would say no. And, uh, and so in a world of Bitcoin, uh, people can start voting with their dollars and they can withdraw their consent uh, in a peaceful way. And, uh, and now uh, nation states have to ask permission. You know, another way that Bitcoin saves lives is uh, you know, we know a lot of our older generation who work hard every day. They trade their, their time, talent, and energies to, to eke out a living, and then they set money aside in savings, and uh, only to be robbed by inflation. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, give away my age here, but for me, I remember buying gas at 60 cents a gallon, 80 cents a gallon, and now here we are, you know, over $4 in California. And that's a, a, an example of purchasing power that's been stolen from, from us uh, over the years. Uh, you know, you look back at a, a pre-1964, uh, 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 you know, quarter. Uh, you know, when they were when they were consisted of silver. You know, 90% silver, 
it now takes over, I believe, over seven of those today to buy one of those 1964 quarters. <laughs> and the reason is, is the purchasing power of our money has lost 97% of its value since, since uh, uh, you know, 1960s. And so if you were, you know, like my grandparents, saving dollars, you know, you were just robbed 97% of your life because it took your life energy and your, your uh, blood, sweat, and tears to earn that income. And it was stolen from you over the last 30 to 60 years or however many years it's been. And, uh, and so that is, you know, people die because they don't have the funds to give themselves maybe the health care they need, the nutrition they need. And, uh, and, and that's another way we can, we can opt out of that system. So everybody I know who's put a little bit of insurance money into Bitcoin over the last five years has really done extremely well. And they've provided their own little insurance factor. So I, I tell people never buy any more than you can afford to lose. But what if you just took 1% or 5% if you want to be adventurous? Or if you're a young person, uh, you might want to buy more Bitcoin. But... Uh, you know, if the whole system crashes around us and we see the dollar, which I think is a, a mathematical uh, 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 absolute that's going to happen, you know, when we see the dollar uh, do this, um, that 1% that we were holding uh, Bitcoin and maybe a little bit in gold and silver uh, could save our portfolio and help us from the devastation that's coming. So, uh, so you know, personally, I hate dollars. I hate... Uh, any kind of uh, national currency because I know they can be counterfeited and printed at will. Uh, I don't like what they finance. So personally, you know, anytime I get dollars, I try and get rid of them. I like holding, you know, real goods like gold, silver, supplies, food supplies, food storage, uh, property. If 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 you can protect it, property is a little hard to protect because it's so easily taxed. Um, and then your mobile wealth of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a uh, you know, just like gold and silver are scarce physical commodities, uh, Bitcoin is a scarce digital commodity, and it gives you certain advantages, uh, and one of them being the mobility of your money, the mobility of your wealth. And uh, and so what I'll be talking about in uh, in, in the uh, Dare to Escape event is, uh, uh, you know, the Global Online Summit. I'll be talking about how Bitcoin, used properly, can be the ultimate offshore bank account, and you'll never have to go out uh, outside your borders to use it because uh, cyberspace is the ultimate offshore and if you use the right tools you can now have the ultimate offshore bank account well I find it um, uh, let me just go here uh, there's probably no way uh, better to end it than with that right there being said um, there's just so much that we can I mean we can go on for hours about Bitcoin but I um, I truly Thank you from uh, for joining me tonight about Bitcoin and educating us from from many different points of views. But the whole key is that um, here at Escape Bars, we invite people to open up their minds, take a look at um, you know how to protect their assets, how to look at um, you know the undiscovered country and explore, live, work, play, retire, and invest anywhere around the world. And Bitcoin's a big part of that. It actually fits in there. Um, so I want to thank you very much for your time tonight. It's just. Um, so much information and I want to thank everyone who attended tonight the, the webinar um, we have these webinars every Thursday and we have a special guest every week and tonight we have Stephen Michael so it was very exciting to have you here um, so much to capture so much information I look forward to hearing your part on the Global Online Summit and uh, look very very forward to you hosting the first Bitcoin Online Summit uh, coming up in here in June so um, definitely um, once again if you get a chance uh, I believe the BitcoinOnlineSummit.com will be launching uh, coming next week or coming this weekend. So you want to be the one of the first ones there for sure. I think you're uh, running a special for the first few people. So Bitcoin uh, BitcoinOnlineSummit.com will be the site on where lives would literally change forever for the information that's going to be provided there. So uh, I want to say thank you, Stephen, for all the time that you've uh, given us tonight and. Um, I'll let you have the last few words since I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute myself. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I, you know, I, I can't add much more because if you let me get going, I'll talk another three hours on Bitcoin. But uh, um, I'm just looking forward to the, to the events, both events, and I'm excited to uh, be a part of it. I thank you for inviting me and getting me involved. And, uh, um, you know, if you love liberty, if you love your life, and if you love uh, uh, protecting your property, 
uh, you're in the right place with Escape Artist and uh, the online summit. So um, you're going to have a good time with this. Well, thank, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And I'll see you guys next week. Thank you, Stephen. We'll see you at the Global Online Summit. Thank you, everyone.